very much, Yasin. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, yeah, as Yasin said, I'm one of the CT1s. And yeah, it's nice to be joining you on this talk. So today we're going to delve into the world of endocrinology. Um, I apologize in advance if my internet goes wayward. But we're going to do questions. Uh, you have about a minute and then we'll go through the answers. So here's question one. Um, and let's start. Have a minute. Five more seconds, get your answers in. Right, Marva, so I can see that we've had quite a good spread of results there. It seems most people have gone for Graves' disease. And that would be, if we go on to the next slide, please, we'll find that that is indeed the right answer. So there are a few pointers in this question the points us towards the correct diagnosis. So first of all, this woman is young. Uh, she's come in as well with clear signs of hypothyroidism with the tachycardia and a fine tremor that you've noticed on examination. But also she's got this rash on the lower legs, which we can assume might be related and may very well be pretibial myxedema. And it's the fact that it's a diffuse goiter as well that points to signs. Now from the other options, they're not unreasonable, a postpartum thyroiditis is something you would think about in a young woman because that is thyroid dysfunction that occurs within 12 months of pregnancy and typically does go through a hypothyroid, then a hypothyroid phase, and then they become euthyroid. But the other options here really don't kind of add up. The subacute thyroiditis is usually viral and people will complain of a painful goiter. Um, a thyroid cancer, there's no suggestions here of this being a thyroid cancer, no red flag symptoms, certainly, including airway compromise or indeed any issues with um, uh, any issues with voice and speech through the current laryngeal nerve and toxic multinodular goiter happens afterwards. Now, already I've had, uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so we've already had a question of, do you, do you not need to have eye symptoms to graze? So that's a very good question. So what I would say about that is eye changes in graves, you will only find clinically within a third of patients. Radiologically, you will find in around um, nine, over all patients, you will find radiologically changes with the eyes. And that is because of the effects that the TSH receptor has on the actual um, inferior, um, inferior and lateral recti. It causes them to swell. Uh, and this will cause partly the proctosis and the diplopia that you see with patients. So most people will have, but it's a spectrum. But in terms of graves, this is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. This is something which you should always consider in a young lady with autoimmune diseases obviously predisposed. And they can usually have a family history of other AI conditions such as vitiligo. And the most common is pernicious anemia. Now we've touched upon um, some of the, about eye changes. And one of the key things to remember in anybody with graves is that you tell them to stop smoking because smoking will worsen all eye disease and it's very, very dangerous in these patients and they're more likely to have actual visual change loss. Um, aside from that then, the other things that we need to think about are um, the actual diagnosis. So the key feature of Graves versus some of the other conditions is the fact that there is um, eye signs, which you don't find in any of the cause, Pretibial myxedema, which is only present in around 5%, um, but is kind of a non pitting edema, which can affect the lower limbs, but also the back. Um, and also that you've got the TSH receptor antibodies, which are positive. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So in terms of managing graves, this is very important. As I've said, the most important thing is that you tell patients to stop smoking. 
you may very well need to give them some beta blockers. And this lady, she's got some fine tremor tachycardic. It may very well be sensible to do so. And you would have done a thyroid function test to work out just how hyperthyroid she is. Now, our medical treatment is to use, for instance, carbimazole or propothyroid And these work by reducing iodine synth uh, thyroid hormone synthesis through iodine incorporation in thyroglobulin. Now, there are two main ways that we can do this. We can either treat with a block and replace, or we can just treat with carbimazole alone. And actually, systematic reviews show that there is no difference in outcomes. But what we generally do is give 18 months of treatment, and we would expect 50% of patients to go into remission. But that means that 50% of patients don't respond. Um, now, a key thing with these treatments, particularly carbimazole, is the effect of agranulocytosis which will always come up in exams, uh, happens realistically on only about 0.5%. Um, and this is something you should alert patients to. So if they get a sore throat or any signs of illness, they need an FTC done urgently by their GP and a review. Now, in the instance that they failed medical treatment, we may move on to radioiodine. Now, this obviously, and I've underlined, don't do it for pregnant women. Um, this is important. And you would also say that um, for pregnant women, they should not... Um, become pregnant for some time afterwards, usually three to six months. Um, in terms of its treatment, it will worsen eye disease. So it's very important that these patients are screened appropriately to make sure that that's not um, an issue. And you want to stop any antithyroid medications that they're on. The use of iodine will cause destruction of the thyroid, and so there's an increased risk of thyroid storm. And moving on from that, if really nothing's working, then obviously we can move on to surgery. Um, where hypothyroidism is the major risk, along with hypoparathyroidism and injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerves with vocal cord paralysis. So that's great disease. Well done. Let's move on to the next question then. So have a minute. Sorry, just while people are answering that question, if you don't mind putting any questions you have into the Q&A and not the chat, um, and that's just so that we don't miss out on your questions, if that's okay, because the Q&A kind of keeps them nice and all together for us. And that's just 10 seconds left on the poll. Okay, so we've got the answers here. So people have given quite a variety here. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I'll reveal the answer. Um, and that would be with bated breath, oral glucose tolerance test. So I can see that obviously we've written a few thoughts of what to do. So clearly from this history, there are some things that are suggestive of acromegaly. So we know that he's he's got some signs, not the general descriptions of a speed like hands and whatever not, but he's got some sleepiness and snoring and OSA is very much linked with acromegaly, but he's also got signs of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome with this reduced strength in his left hand and numbness in the thumb. I remember loaf muscles are done by the medium nerve. Now, in terms of how we go into this, the important thing is that we need to demonstrate that growth hormone levels are now working in an uncontrolled fashion and they are no longer responding to negative feedback. That is the key thing. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll talk about acromegaly and then a bit about the investigations. So acromegaly is a condition that is quite rare. You only have around two to three um, per kind of million who will have this in terms of incidence. And it's often diagnosed at the age of around 40. And this is a condition where we have excess growth hormone, usually because of the pituitary adenoma. But I should add to you that ectopic growth hormone is very important cause. 
and this is particularly from lung cancers, pancreas cancers, and ovarian cancers. And what growth hormone does, it works through its effector, which is insulin growth like factor one, which was one of the options. And this is what causes the kind of change within soft tissue growth, but with basically all of your organs. And that's why um, bodybuilders, for instance, inject themselves with growth hormone. And this figure on the left just shows some kind of characteristic features. Now, some of the important things I would draw yourself to is the characteristic faces that you can describe. So if you think that somebody has this, then you should really ask for photos and to see the differences there. Um, and then what we, what we like to do as well is be aware of the increased risk these patients have, particularly of heart failure, which you can see. Uh, colonic polyps, so these patients after the age of 40 do require um, colonoscopy in order, to, um, in order to assess for risk of colon cancer, but also um, the risk as well of thyroid cancer. So thyroid cancer is actually the most common malignancy associated with acromegaly, um, and you might be able to see a lot of these features. Now, as I said, normally what happens is when you have a meal, your growth hormone levels go down. Now, if there is uncontrolled release of growth hormone, then this is why, um, this is why you get, uh, in acromegaly, we demonstrate this with all glucose tolerance tests. We cannot suppress the actual growth hormone. Now, if we move on to the next slide, I'll talk about the investigations. Now, one of the options that we had was IGF-1. Now, insulin growth factor 1 is good as an initial screen, okay? And if you had somebody who was um, demonstrating some of the features, you could do IGF-1. And that does have a long half-life, and it is sensitive, more so than growth hormone. Remember, growth hormone is released in a pulsatile fashion, which is why we can't use it to diagnose. But there is significant variability in how we measure it. And it is raised in patients, for instance, with chronic kidney disease, liver disease, and with thyroid issues. And the key thing here is that we demonstrate that the growth hormone is no longer suppressed by the normal mechanisms. That's in endocrine and endocrinology the important thing, that there is now negative feedback is no longer being applied. So the oral glucose tolerance test is the demonstrative test for this, whilst all those others that were mentioned are there just to, you know, the MRI, for instance, pituitary will show you that there's an adenoma, but it won't tell you anything about is it hormones hormone secreting, for instance. So what you do is you give an oral glucose tolerance test, and if the growth hormone levels fail to become less than one microgram per liter, then this diagnoses, and this, um, uh, this will tell you that this patient does have acromegaly. Now, in terms of the management of this, you, the first line will always be that you do transphenoidal surgery, um, and this is the way that we do it. I, I've just had a question, which was about what is raised in liver and thyroid disease. That was IGF-1. So IGF-1, as I said, is a screen, but that will be raised in the instance of that. Um, now, um, if they're not suitable for surgery, which would be um, because they grow old because of other comorbidities, then you can use somatostatin receptor ligand. So this is, for instance, so you can use somatostatin to do this, octreotide, these kind of things. And these do actually have good outcomes. There is talk, and you may read in the books about using radiotherapy. That is something that takes a long time to actually work and can often take years before somebody actually improves. Um, uh, and it's not really a mainstay. And this is something that you would use in patients as a really last resort. There are some newer medications I haven't, mess, uh, haven't mentioned on the slide, such as a recombinant growth hormone receptor agonist, which is called pegvisamant. And this is used if everything else has failed. Um, but this is something that is extremely expensive and nice being the way that they are, don't like to do it. But the key thing for this question is that you need to demonstrate that you can no longer, re um, uh, you can no longer reduce the levels of growth hormone and they're not responding to feedback. Whilst all the other options were there just to demonstrate that there may be a lesion, but they don't tell you exactly what it is. All right, so we can move on to the next question.
Okay. Um, I haven't seen the poll. Did you? Oh, we're still doing the questions. So. Yeah, five more seconds. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to answer the, all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so with this question then, so we have somebody with osteoporosis, we have clear confirmation of that on a DEXA scan, and alindronic acid is correct. That is the correct answer. So this is something that is very, very important. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and all the other options we'll talk about what they do. So osteoporosis is a massive problem. You're going to see a lot of this when you graduate. As it says here, about 2 million women have osteoporosis, and we have about 180,000 fractures a year. Now, the key thing with this is that actually, if you have, for instance, a hip fracture related to osteoporosis, about um, permanent disability occurs in around 50%, and only 30% are expected to recover at all. So this is a massive issue. Now, when we think about the risk factors for this, if you ignore the family history bit um, on the slide, you can see that I've spelt out shattered, that gives the kind of general risk factors for why people are at increased risk of um, osteoporosis. Uh, and especially when we've got some of our elderly patients, uh, an important thing is to always consider, when I say metabolic bone disease, about whether or not this could be myeloma, and that's why they have fracture. But generally, with patients with osteoporosis, what you want to do is establish that they have risks, and you would like a DEXA scan in order to classify just how severe it is. And the table on the bottom right shows you the different scores that you would do um, with osteoporosis confirmed if it's less than minus 2.5 versus the kind of normal limit. Now, um, the FRAX tool is a, a means um, that made by the University of Sheffield, which allows you to estimate the 10 year risk of somebody having a fracture. Um, an osteoporotic fracture. And this is a good way, especially in primary care, but also secondary care, to work out someone's risk and to see would they benefit from doing bone mineral density scans. But certainly you should um, always be doing DEXA scans in patients who you think are osteoporotic, unless they're over 75, in which case you could be a bit more relaxed. And if they've got two or more risk factors, then you can treat. Can we go to the next slide, please? So in terms of how osteoporosis presents. Well, we can see here on this little image, this is a typical wedge fracture that you would see. And obviously the spine is a major site of osteoporotic fractures along with the hip, humerus, and obviously the wrist. Now, in terms of the management, this is multidisciplinary. You want to ensure good nutrition. And we always say about making sure the patients are calcium and vitamin D replete, so they have enough of that. Um, I must admit, there is actually very little evidence of if your vitamin D is normal, that you have better outcomes. Um, but it, all the trials have been done with that, so we do that. Exercise, because that will strengthen the bone, and reduce falls. Remember, these are elderly patients, and if we can reduce falls, then we can reduce the incidence of fractures. Now, in terms of treatment, bisphosphonates are first line, uh, and we should really use those in all patients, and they can reduce fracture risk by around 40%. Um, now, so somebody's just mentioned what's a DEXA scan. A DEXA scan is a, uh, it's basically a fancy x-ray scan that looks at the bone mineral density. And the gold standard is to do it at the neck of femur. Uh, and that gives you a very good indicator of what the rest of the, um, what the rest of the bone mineral density is around the body and gives you a good idea um, the quality of the bone that's there. Now, in terms of the treatment, as I was saying, bisphosphonates are first line. Now, there are some serious side effects that we should be aware of. So jaw necrosis, you will always be asked about this. This is um, a massive issue. So before starting bisphosphonates, you should make sure patients have their dental checkups. Um, and that would be important just to avoid this and have any treatments that they need to before starting. Um, atypical femoral fractures. Now, they, whilst bisphosphonates do drastically reduce, as I said, around 40% reduction in fractures, they do cause these atypical femoral fractures. So that is, they don't form the normal pattern of fracture that we will see in the textbooks. Um, and this is something to be aware of. And there is also a risk, and there is an association with um, alindronic acid particularly, and some of the newer agents, such as uh, zolindronic acid and AF. Uh, and this is something that's being studied. 
Now, if patients, um, the only patient group that really bisphosphonates aren't very good at is in CKD. Uh, it's renally cleared, so you should avoid them. And we should always tell patients um, um, about how to take bisphosphonates. First medication of the morning, 30 minutes before everything else, on an empty stomach with plenty of water, because reflux will be quite bad. So you need to make sure that you're on a PPI. Now, a good example of a branded or commonly used bisphosphonate is alandronic acid or alendronate, just to, I can see the chats. Now, somebody asked about what the significance of the clot was. So that was to show you why you wouldn't pick raloxifen. Now, raloxifen is a second line treatment. It's very good, actually. And it's what we call a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So you may have heard of one of these before with the instance of breast cancer and tamoxifen. Now, what will this do is that it reduces um, bone turnover uh, and will help to actually assist with improving and maintaining bone mineral density. I remember postmenopausal women are the main people who are affected with osteoporosis. Now, one of the side effects, well, one of the beneficial things I should say first about uh, raloxifen, if you go back to the next slide, is that it reduces the risk of breast cancer. So if women have a high risk of breast cancer and you want to reduce that risk, raloxifen is a good, good idea. But one of the um, side effects on this is increased risk of VTE. So because she's got a family history of VTE, then you would want to, um, you would want to avoid this because this would increase this. Now, the third line is teriparatide. You will hardly ever see this being given. You can only give this um, with specialist request. And this is a parathyroid hormone, um, kind of recombinant parathyroid hormone peptide. Now, you might be like, well, why would you give parathyroid hormone, considering that is a risk for osteoporosis if you're hyperparathyroid? Well, if you give um, intermittent exogenous parathyroid hormone, then this actually stimulates your osteoblasts more than your osteoblasts and you actually form bone and they are fantastic for particularly spinal disease uh, especially if your t scores are less than minus 4.5 um, so that's one of the reasons why you would use teriparatide but it's a last line agent um, and it's not something routinely given um, denosumab is a new agent that's given um, now in specialist bone clinics and that affects osteoclasts and how they basically bind to bone um, and this is a monoclonal antibody, and once again, under specialist kind of review. But generally, first line will always be bisphosphonates. Uh, and I've he I see here, is DEXA always an uh, indicated in suspected osteoporosis? Yes, unless you're over 75 and you've got clear risk factors. Or you're somebody who has, for instance, if I'm 60 and I'm going to be on steroids for the next 60 years, high dose, I would start them on a bisphosphonate, knowing full well that they will become osteoporotic as a result of this. I would, however, get a DEXA scan, but I wouldn't wait for the DEXA scan because it, it wouldn't, all it will give me is a baseline for me to compare with later. And generally, you give five years worth of treatment and then you will, um, and then you will uh, review and see if you need to do anything and you remeasure. Um, another question is what's the difference between DEXA and a bone scan? So a DEXA scan is just looking at bone mineral density that uses x-rays. Bone scans are using radio, um, radio kind of, uh, what am I trying to say, nuclear imaging and agents like that, uh, and wouldn't be useful in osteoporosis. We use it for other things. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the next question now. I will answer all the other questions in due course. So let's look through this. Okay, so 10 more seconds. Five more seconds. Okay, so I'll answer. 
response to that later. So um, this is a question on diabetes management, something which is the bane of most of our lives. But C is the correct answer here, GLP-1 mimetic, and we'll go through exactly why that may be the case. So can we go to the next slide, please? So what, first of all, let's talk about GLP-1 mimetics. So GLP-1s are glucagon-like peptides, and these examples are like exenatide or riglutide. Now, what these medications do is they augment something called the incretin effect. Now, you may have heard this before and not understood what it is. And basically, all it suggests is if I was to give you intravenous glucose, and if I was to give you the same amount but orally, that the oral glucose would stimulate more insulin secretion. And the reason for that is because of these hormones, GIP, gastric inhibitory polypeptide, and GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. Now, what they do is they, first of all, not only stimulate beta cells of the pancreas, but they keep them from surviving. And remember, with type 2 diabetics, with time, they will gradually lose their beta cells and they may need to stay on and may be put on insulin. Um, so they stimulate insulin release acutely, but also they limit glucagon release as well. So glucagon obviously is what breaks down um, your glycogen and increases the sugars more. So they really help with your sugar levels. Now, when do you use these treatments? You use them when triple therapy hasn't worked. Now, this patient is on metformin, is on glycoside, and now we're at a crossroads. They've tried some linagliptin and that hasn't worked out. So they've tried the triple therapy. And realistically, your main issues here is whether I go for insulin or whether I go for um, whether I go for GLP-1. Now he has some compelling reasons to do it. He has a BMI over 35. So that's a very good case. So obesity is a big thing because these treatments usually cause weight loss because they induce early satiety. So that means you feel full very early on. And that's because they inhibit gastric emptying as well. But we'd also use them in obesity associated illness or if insulin therapy isn't a good idea. Now this chap is a lorry driver. He can't be going to the side of the road every five seconds and checking his sugars and giving himself insulin. It, would, it was um, a contraindication. You couldn't be a lorry driver and an insulin driver. Those rules have relaxed now a little bit, but you would err on the side of caution here because this would not be a, a good idea if he was to have a hypo whilst driving. But to use GLP-1s, you need, for their continued use, I should say, you need to demonstrate that they're effective. And to do that, you need a 1% HbA1c decrease, and that will usually correlate to around a third risk reduction um, in major cardiovascular events, and you need a 3% weight loss. So these are good targets. And as you know, if you lose weight, you increase your insulin sensitivity. But they do have some major side effects. These include acute pancreatitis, which you do see, and I have seen in practice. They do cause a bit of nausea and vomiting. And then one of the bad things is that they are infection. So if people don't like needles, well, yeah, it's a bit of a shame. But insulin is much better because you're going to be doing the same thing. Um, but there is links as well with cancer, particularly medullary thyroid cancer and auriculotide. But this is very, very li literally case reports, and the risk is dubious at best. Can we go to the next slide? So going on how do we move from treatments, in terms of treatment escalation, most patients you would have seen have started on metformin. This is great if they're obese. This is uh, a very good measure because we know it causes low risk of hypoglycemic events and it can induce weight loss. Now, if that's failed, you will see most patients move on to one of three options. Most patients will move on a sulfonylurea. So that's glycoside and things like that. Now, glycoside is uh, it's a good drug. Um, the only problem is, is the risk of hypos, and most patients, a uh, few patients don't like it um, because it can cause weight gain. So this is something to be aware of. But sulfonylurea is a, a common. We can also use pioglitazones. Now, pioglitazone is one of the long-named groups. So this is a thiazolidinodiones, and these work in a very funny way. It basically reduces fat, uh, fat metabolism and increases, therefore, insulin sensitivity because you're not using the free fatty acids instead. But this chap is not a good idea to use this for one reason. He has, um, he's had, and we've said, two previous myocardial infarctions. He's at high risk of heart failure. Pioglitazone is well known to not only cause heart failure, but worsen heart failure. It is also um, linked with osteoporosis. And the other agent that we can use are DPP-4 inhibitors. But as we said before, this chap has tried linagliptin. 
and linagliptin is a DPP4, and that doesn't work. Now, DPP4 is part of the incretins. DPP4 is what breaks down GLP1 and GLP. So because you don't break it down, it stays around in the circulation more, and that's how it has an effect. But he is not a good idea. So we've come to the triple therapy, so it's either insulin or GLP-1. Now, the gray box here where it says SGLT2 inhibitors, they are very good, and they're relatively new. I say that. The first one came in 2003. Um, and you can use them as monotherapy in select patients, okay? Um, Ertagliflozin is the name. We can write it up later. The, 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 the point is they're very good in patients with heart failure, but we haven't really worked out where to introduce them <laughs> in this arena. So usually people will try it after they've tried two agents. You may then put them in SGLT2 inhibitor. He might very well benefit from this, but he has got bigger issues with his weight um, and the previous failures. So actually with him, um, I would still err on the side and give a GLP-1 but you should be aware that these are an emerging drug class that will probably revolutionize diabetes meds in the years to come. All right, let's move on to the next question. Okay, 10 more seconds left. And five. Okay, so let's see with this. So I think this went very right. Okay, so I can see here that most people have gone for E. That is the correct answer. Now let's look at this question a bit more closely. There are some things here that if I had this in clinic, I would be very concerned about. He's 64, he's extensive smoking, and he's coming with a new cough. As soon as somebody has told me, now this chap probably has COPD, we know that because he's an extensive smoker. But if somebody describes a new cough of, on, on top of his uh, usual cough, this is a concerning feature. Uh, and this warrants investigation. You would immediately do a chest x-ray if you were a GP or, or anything else. Now you also note that he has clubbing. Clubbing for respiratory illness is only a few things. So COPD, I really want you to remember, is not a cause of clubbing. The only respiratory causes of clubbing will be lung cancer, pulmonary fibrosis, bronchiectasis, an empyema, an abscess, or a pulmonary arteriovenous malformation, and TB. That's about it. There isn't really anything else that's going to cause it. And he's had cases of hemoptysis. So before you've even read the rest of the question, you know that this chap has a high risk of lung cancer before we even start. We then find that he has um, problems with the sitting, rising from the sitting position. Now that describes proximal myopathy. Now, proximal myopathy in the context of COPD is very, very common. These are usually wasted. But, um, oh, somebody wants me to repeat those clubbing causes. So fibrosis, TB, Amp lung abscess, empyema, uh, bronchiectasis, there was something, a pulmonary AVM, they're the main ones, and obviously lung cancer. Now, the sitting position, very important, and then we've said about the purple striae of the skin. Purple striae, all right, white striae, they're stretch marks, all right? Purple striae, the reason they're purple is because you're seeing the dermis, the underlying layer of the skin. So you've, you've eroded the epidermis, you're seeing the dermis, which is vascular, which is why they're purple. So this should make you think of Cushing's. So ectopic ACTH release is correct. Now let's move on to the next and we'll talk a little bit about Cushing's. So Cushing syndrome is rarer than people think, but we often see a lot of um, Cushing syndrome because obviously we see a lot of people on steroids and we see the common moon face that you'll see and you will see it and you will look and you go that's a moon face and I've written it in a lot of documents um, but with Cushing syndrome you get the classical um, classical effects of increased glucocorticoids which will be 
um, not only soft tissue edema, but also the fact of increased adiposity, mostly um, uh, at centrally, but also those buff, those kind of um, the buffalo hump that we describe. And you will also get the thin skin purple striae, and they will often have um, psychiatric symptoms, especially if it's acute. And the key thing that you have to establish is whether this is ACTH dependent or if this is ACTH independent. So what we're saying here is if it's ACTH Sorry guys, technical difficulties today. Uh, I don't know where Dom's gone. Um, so I'll just crack on to be honest with what's going on. So um, so yeah, Dom was talking about uh, ACTH dependent and uh, ACTH independent Cushing syndrome. So, so Cushing syndrome really describes this, anyone who has increased steroids. Um, in their in their blood and and Cushing's disease tends to be discussing someone who has a um, a, a tumor or an adenoma um, and really the um, was I think what Tom was what he was getting at was that you can sometimes get ectopic secretion and he was saying that uh, I think it was small cell um, lung cancer that is the most likely uh, to cause a ACTH dependent ectopic tumor. So you can get those sorts of Cushingoid features in people who have lung cancer. Um, so uh, the, the other thing about, um, so I haven't really prepared, sorry, so bear with me with regards to some other rare stuff like McCoon Albright syndrome. But certainly in patients, there's this concept of pseudo Cushing's. So with Cushing's, pseudo Cushing's, it sort of looks a bit like Cushing syndrome in the sense that they have certain features such as personality changes, hyperglycemia, and, and it, it is sort of, and, and the sort of moon face and whatever, you have, whatever have you, and, and fluid retention. But it sort of doesn't have that sort of increased steroids that you would expect. And I don't think the mechanism is very well understood, but certainly it, it can be related to people who have diabetes and also those who have excess alcohol. And um, so that's something that um, is... Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. I took over for a sec. So I'm just talking about pseudo Cushing's. And uh, do you know what the mechanism, Dom, is for pseudo Cushing's? Um, it, oh, it's, it's very complicated, but the yeah. point, I think th what I would generally say at your stage is, is that you have features of Cushing's, but you don't have biochemical evidence that you've got increased cortisol or cortisol like substances. So if you imagine if they're excess alcohol, you will commonly get this central adiposity, the wasting of the muscles, you know, you will get that phenotype, the dad bod that you see in the kind of late fifties, <laughs> sixties. So that is the feature, but there are some complex hormone changes and that is beyond the scope of what, uh, you know, I wouldn't touch that with a barge ball. Yeah, I think it's, it's very but difficult. It's, so yeah, we yeah it's, it's something yeah. to think about. Um, in terms of, are you happy for me to go through? Yeah, yeah, crack on. Sorry, Dom, I just sort of took over. Yeah, I got it. So somebody's question there is, so what's the difference between Cushing syndrome and disease? Cushing's disease suggests that this is a pituitary cause. If it's Cushing syndrome, that can be from exogenous steroids, that can be from a cancer, that can be for you know, an ectopic cancer, that could be from anything else, or rarer syndromes, okay? Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And my apologies again, guys, I'm curious. So how do we confirm Cushing's? So the big thing here um, is that you have to demonstrate there's increased uh, cortisol. Now, you used to see using about doing 24-hour urine-free cortisol, it's a waste of time. Never select that answer. You need to, because honestly, what you need to do is you need to do two or more collections. You also need to measure the, 20, the urine, um, urine creatinine, and there can't be uh, more than 10% variation between the samples. And it takes an awful long time. So late night salivary cortisol is a very good screen, actually. And I think that we'll see this more, much more routinely in hospitals of doing uh, kind of midnight cortisol, and that will tell you where, where we're at. But Generally, what you'll do is that you will see about doing a low dose dexamethasone suppression test. So this is where you give one milligram at around midnight, and then you will measure uh, first thing in the morning, eight or nine a.m. to see what the cortisol is. And obviously, what we're trying to see is dexamethasone is a synthetic glucocorticoid. It has extremely high glucocorticoid activity versus morenal corticoid, and it should obviously suppress your cortisol to less than 50 is the cutoff that you would say less than 50. It should sub completely suppress cortisol because of negative feedback. Now, in the instance that that's happened, the next question you've got, so you've demonstrated that I've given dexamethasone, 
and the cortisol is still detectable, it's still raised. The next thing you need to do is look at the ACTH, okay? Now with the ACTH, what you want to see is, is this increased? Now, obviously if it was negative feedback, if I've got loads of cortisol, I would expect negative feedback to cause reduction in my ACTH, that should be very, very low. If it's very raised, then we know straight away this is either pituitary cause or an ectopic cause, because something is secreting that ACTH, whether it's a pituitary cancer or an ectopic cancer, such as the small cell lung cancer, carcinoid, and even pheochromocytomas can also secrete this. So that would be one. And if it's in between, then you will need to really discern what to do next. So you would do a high dose dexamethasone suppression test. Now, this is where you give the patient eight milligrams of dexamethasone. So we're talking the big guns here. And you'll do that for 48 hours. And the point is, if it's a pituitary lesion, then you should be able to suppress it versus an ectopic. If it's an ectopic cancer, they are spearing ACTH left, right, and center every five seconds. So you won't make much of a dent. But if the ACTH levels are very low, so they are reduced and they're correct for that increased cortisol that we're seeing, then actually you know that therefore this cortisol must be coming from directly the adrenals. And then you will be thinking, is this an adrenal adenoma or carcinoma? Now, if we go uh, and we can, I think I go on to how to treat, but basically if it's an adrenal cancer, it's very bad. Um, and it's usually medical treatment for most because most of the time they've already uh, metastasized. But this is a kind of a run through of how you would go about testing for Cushing's. And then the treatment would be, if it's a pituitary um, cancer, then you would really want to do transphenoidal surgery. I'm happy to answer any questions on, on this later. Let's move on to the next question because we're through time. Okay, let's try this one with 30 seconds just for the sake of time. So 20 seconds left. And 10 seconds. Let's have a little look. Amiodarone, that is the correct answer. So first of all, let's just run through the options quickly. Amlodipine does not do anything to thyroid function tests, so we should be very careful. And also a history of arrhythmia, amlodipine is not, um, a, is not a centrally acting, cardiac acting um, calcium channel block, it's peripheral. So it wouldn't be used in arrhythmia, so there are two reasons there. Bisoprolol, as you know, bisoprolol um, is used in the context of hypothyroidism. It will affect thyroid function in that it, it de decreases the conversion of T4 to T3, but it doesn't change your, T your, T your thyroid function test. It just affects the peripheral conversion. Fleconide, that's a class one um, antiarrhythmic, but that has no effect. And aspirin can have an effect on TFTs, but it's anecdotal. Uh, it's, not, it's not actually anything that is known. So amiodarone is the correct answer. Let's go on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about it. So amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic. We use it for VT and VF, basically. And you will also see it um, for people who have had that and for prophylaxis. But you'll see it in, obviously, the cardiac arrest situation where we give it after the kind of third cycle. Now, in oh, third shock, I mean. But in terms of amiodarone, it has a huge amount of iodine in it, about 37%. And it also um, has a very long half-life. It sticks around for ages, around 90 days. Now, what I'm talking about next is a bit abstract, and it's something that I wish somebody told me in med school. So this is the wolf chakov effect and the jod Bazdow effect. And now, the wolf chakov effect is simple. It is, if, I'm, if I've got a normal thyroid and I give somebody iodine, then the normal effect is that the thyroid will stop making thyroid hormone. Okay, so if I give somebody exogenous iodine in a normal thyroid, and that thyroid gland will actually reduce the amount of thyroid hormone it produces. The jod based our effect, however, is in the setting of an abnormal thyroid, particularly patients with Graves, but also with very, very severe iodine deficiency. If you give iodine to them, 
then what happens is they actually start to spew out too much thyroid, too much thyroid hormone, and so they can go into thyroid storm. Now, amyo, so this is uh, this will be important about why the type one and type two. Now, other side effects of amiodarone that we should all be aware of is the effects it has on the lungs. So pneumonitis and fibrosis, very important. Liver failure, very important. Obviously, an antiarrhythmic, one of the biggest things it can cause is an arrhythmia. Visual changes, it does. It will affect the cornea and you get this vertex um, keratitis. And it gives you this slate gray skin, which I always love the description in the books. Now, in terms of the effects amiodarone has on thyroid function, we have a type one and type two. So type one is where the, is in the setting that the uh, thyroid is abnormal. And so remember what we said about the job based error effect. If you give someone amiod, if you give someone iodine, and remember amiodarone contains a lot of iodine to somebody with an abnormal um, thyroid, then what they'll get is a lot of thyroid production, a lot of thyroid release. So what you find with these patients is that they, they start to form goiter and they will have increased vascularity because they get loads of thyroid. If you imagine they're getting so much blood flow to that thyroid now because it's pumping out so much, that's what we get. And they will have lots of T4 in their system. And they may also have antibodies as well. So these patients are people that you follow up and you would treat them as if they're a normal Graves patient. You would treat them with carbimazole and you would treat them with propothyroidacil. And you would seriously think about stopping the amiodarone. Okay. Type two is very different. So, type two now is the effect where you've taken the amiodarone. And what happens now is that the thyroid gland just falls apart. It releases all the hormone that it has stored there. Um, and this is the one where instead of now the thyroid is making too much thyroid hormone, what's happening here is it's just releasing everything it's got. So with these ones, I should add for type two attacks, this occurs over much longer periods. You will notice that this occurs many, many months after starting, whereas type one reactions occur very, very quickly. And with those ones, because of all this into all this thyroid release, we can give steroids. And steroids, if you ever read about how to treat um, thyroid storm, steroids are a big part of that because they affect the conversion of T4 to T3. So that's a kind of run through and we'll I'll just see if there's any questions pertinent to this. Um, yes, so somebody's asked about amiodarone causing hypothyroidism. That is correct. Amiodarone can, can actually cause hypo and hyperthyroidism. And actually, hypothyroidism is more common. But because of what you're trying to do, think about it. If you induce hypothyroidism in somebody who's on amiodarone, that is actually very good because their arrhythmic risk is huge. Yeah, that's the only reason we would use amiodarone. So if I've made them hypothyroid, that means I've, I've really put the brakes on their heartbeat. I'll make them slower. I'll decrease the risk of arrhythmia. And actually, this is now not much of a worry. Whereas if I make them hypothyroid, we know that they've got high risk of arrhythmia. This is just adding, you know, we're just adding uh, fire into the mix and we're just going to make things worse. I hope that answers the question and we can come back to it if not. Let's move on to the next question. Right, let's give 30 seconds on this one, I think. Sorry if that's mean. Ten more seconds. Yeah, ten seconds is great. Okay, so I I really don't need to teach you guys much. This is correct. Multiple <laughs> endocrine neoplasia. The important thing here, and I want to go through. Well, actually, let's go on to the next question, and and I'll talk through some of the options because you need to know what's makes it the others definitely not. So first of all, what's a FAO? Now, a FAO chromosome is uh, where you get increased release of adrenaline, but mostly, and no adrenaline. So you get uncontrolled release. Now, you would have learned in med school about your 10% rule, you know, 10% of familial, 10% metastatic, 10% bilateral. 
that is not the case. <laughs> so uh, what we would normally say is that actually 10 to 15 percent are malignant, 20 percent are familial, and 20 percent are extra adrenal. So what I'm saying is that these are outside of the adrenal gland. Now remember, you have your sympathetic chain and actually head and neck phaeochromocytomas. These are we call these then a different paragangliomas are extremely common. So if you find somebody who's got su signs suggestive of phaeochromocytoma, but the kidneys and the adrenals look fine, I would look head and neck. That's my good hint. But phaeochromocytomas themselves occur in um, certain familial syndromes. Now we've mentioned, we'll talk about multiple endocrine neoplasia, but neurofibromatosis. So neurofibromatosis is an autosomal dominant disorder. This is a problem of neurofibromin, which is basically puts the brakes on RAS, which is the major proto-oncogene in most cancers. Now, with this condition, you will get um, characteristic features, which are the fact that they will have the cafe au lait spots, um, particularly that they should be over five millimeters when they're under 15. Uh, and then over 15 millimeters in size when they're, uh, when they're in teenagers. And they will also have likely with this seizures, learning disability, a high cases of ADHD, and they will have classical auxiliary freckling, and um, they will also have kind of characteristic scoliosis of the back, for instance, and obviously neurofibromas on the skin, so bumps. And I have seen one of these, so they do exist. So it's not quite that because it has no link with medullary thyroid cancer. Von Hippel-Lindau is a similar, it's a tumor suppressor gene. It's not, this is an autosomal dominant disorder. The key thing you need to know about von Hippel's, it causes cysts, which become cancer. So you get renal cysts, which give you renal cell cancer, and pancreatic cysts, which can cause pancreatic cancer. You also get CNS tumors, particularly hemangioblastomas and retinal angiomas. So, with FAOs, how do we diagnose these? Now, the best one, without a doubt, is you want to do an MRI, but usually you'll do a CT. Um, that is usually the best one. Um, somebody's answered neurofibromas are the present NF1 or NF2. NF1, predominantly, you will get some in NF2. Remember, the main thing that you're going to find in NF2 is bilateral schwannomas. Um, you will also get some other features. You can increase risk of carcinoid in NF2 as well, but we'll go through that. But if you're thinking of that neurofibromas, you think NF1 before anything else. Um, so yeah, you want to do um, an MRI, but you'll most likely do a CT. Now, the MIB-G scan is basically a very good means to work out if you can't find the fail, but you think it's there. And what you do there, this is basically, it's a structural, it's structurally similar to noradrenaline. And so it concentrates in areas where there's increased adrenaline release. So it will concentrate in the adrenals, but anywhere else. So you'll find a fail. But it's very rare. I've had to order it once and I had to come from Spain. So it took a while. Now, in terms of treatment, you give alpha blockade first, and then you give beta blockade. Do not give beta blockade first, because if you do that, you will cause, you will cause um, uh, basically unopposed alpha stimulation and alpha if you remember alpha receptors cause vasoconstriction and you'll get hypertensive crisis so very important but outcomes with this are good now let's go on to the next slide we'll talk about men to be my favorite syndrome just because of its name um, these are all kind of linked disorders men to be what you need to know is very men to a and men to be both have medullary thyroid cancer medullary thyroid cancer has a rubbish prognosis it presents late, it presents in over 75s, and they usually will present with um, red flag features, problem swallowing, maybe voice change. And if you have anybody with medullary thyroid cancer, you must look for a possible fail. You must, because if you go to that operation and you start operating, they will start to have adrenaline release, they will have a hypertensive crisis in theatre, which is not brilliant. So um, in terms of this, with men to be, you would get mucosal neuromas, and they literally look like that, little bumps under the type, uh, under the tongue. They look marfanoid, but they won't have some of the classical marfanoid features, including obviously aortic arch um, diameter kind of increase and the changes to the kind of joints. Um, but this is a classical thing to kind of look at. And 70% of these patients will have, um, if they have FAO, they'll have bilateral FAOs. So you need to be cutting out both. Okay, so let me just see. There was a question that popped up. Let me just see. 
first line for fail. Now, oh yes, I've got to say. Now, first line for investigating fail chromosome people will say urine metanephrines, okay? If you do a 24 hour urine collection in the first instance, I will laugh you out the room. Don't do it. Do a, you can do a urine metanephrine, it's very good. The actual best test is actually plasma metanephrines. They're actually fantastically accurate. The sensitivity is over in around 95, 96%, and they're very easily detectable. Urine metanephrines, they can be affected by several medications. So things that can be affected if you're on libitolol, because obviously that will reduce the amount of uh, things that you're releasing, the adrenaline. Uh, if you're on tricyclic antidepressants, amphetamines, benzos, there's a huge risk. So I would always do that, okay? So I would do plasma metanephrines, but a lot of centers don't do them. So you would do urine metanephrines, and then you can do some other ones. You can do like chromogranin tests. That's a bit beyond where we're at, but that's fine. Um, somebody's also asked, why do we do um, alpha, then beta? If you do beta blockade first, you will cause the, if you block all the beta receptors, basically, the adrenaline can only bind to the alpha receptors. If they bind to the alpha receptors, you will get unopposed vasoconstriction throughout the whole system. You will become ischemic to large areas of your organs, and you will have hypertensive crisis. So you will may have actually made them much worse. So it's safer that you start to block them alpha first, yeah, to stop that, and then you treat them with beta blockade, preferably just before surgery. All right, let's move on to the next question, and I'll answer everything else therein. Give thirty seconds for this one. And 15 seconds left. Five seconds. Okay, so primary hyperparathyroidism is the correct answer here. Now we're going to quickly run through the options and see why that might be the case. All right. So we've got somebody who's 50 a woman, and she's got a slightly raised calcium. You will get this so many times, and people will just ask you what's going on. And it's about using a, a structured kind of way about it. The rest of her bloods are normal. That's quite important. Uh, and she's well. Okay. Now, if anybody says to you, if you have a high calcium, and say now it's about 2.9, now normal is up to 2.6, 2.93, the first thing in a 50-year-old woman I'd be thinking is whether, is this cancer? Okay. In all honesty, 50-year-old, you know, you need to be thinking about this. Um, what you would also want to think is about, obviously, primary hyperparathyroidism. This is very common and occurs in this age group, okay? Now, if we go for the other options, secondary hyperparathyroidism, it can't be that. And the reason for that is secondary hyperparathyroidism suggests that there is a trigger to the parathyroid glands to produce parathyroid hormone. Now, the most common of those will be a low calcium. OK, or a high phosphate, because remember, what does parathyroid hormone do? It increases your calcium reabsorption from the gut, uh, from the sorry, from the kidneys. It will decrease your phosphate reabsorption. And you will also then what it will do is um, it will also increase the conversion of inactive to active vitamin D. So you would expect somebody to if they had secondary hyperparathyroidism to have a normal to low calcium. Does that make sense? So hopefully that does. Other common causes uh, for secondary hyperparathyroidism, therefore, is CKD. CKD, you see secondary hyperparathyroidism. If you have um, gastrointestinal disorders, so you have malabsorption, so I can't absorb my calcium because I have celiacs or whatever, then you may also get secondary hyperparathyroidism as a result. Um, and other ones would also, uh, they are the kind of main ones, really. You can also get in chronic pancreatitis. Pseudo hyperparathyroidism. I know when I say this, people are like, what, what does that mean? What is this? Basically, that means that you are resistant to parathyroid. So you will do their bloods and you will find that the parathyroid hormone is about seven, eight, ten times higher than normal because the body can't do anything with it. You're releasing it and it can't do its end function on the osteoclast and the osteoblast. So in that setting, um, these patients will have very low calcium, actually, high phosphate, and that's the major issue. 
and they'll have characteristic findings as well. Short metacarpals, they're usually short and they may have reduced um, IQ. Vitamin D intoxication, well, you can laugh about that in this country. None of us get enough sun. We're all vitamin D deficient. So if she's on no medications, I don't know how she's managed that. So it's not. And Addison's disease would not present like this. And Addison's is associated with hypercalcemia. So let's go on to primary hypothyroidism now. So the next slide. So I'm, I can see some questions. What are the common causes or whatnot? So the most common cause is adenoma. Okay. Adenoma is the most common cause of primary hyperthyroid, hyperparathyroidism. There is a autonomous secreting part of the actual gland, and that's what's causing the issue. Hyperplasia then is seen next. And actually, it's very common for patients to have um, uh, double, kind of four gland hyperplasia. So it's not just one gland that's enlarged, it's all of them, and they're just secreting a bit more. Cancer is incredibly rare. You do not, parathyroid cancer isn't, it's seen, but it's very, very rare. You wouldn't be, um, that wouldn't be top of your differential it, seeing this person. Now, what you need to be aware of is the classical signs of hypercalcemia and how it presents. So obviously, this stones, bones, groans, thrones, uh, and all that non, all that stuff. Stones refers to, um, nef so that refers to kidney stones because you're becoming increased calcium excretion. I remember what happens is normally in the urine you have citrate which dissolves and keeps the um, the calcium in the liquid, but because you have too much calcium, um, what happens? It precipitates and forms stones. Bones, well, you're hurting because of everything that's happening. The bones are weak and they will bend and they will break. Groans, that refers to the effect it will have on the tummy. So what we're talking about there is particularly the risk of peptic ulcer disease and pancreatitis, which is very important, and thrones. You will go to the toilet and these patients will be constipated. All right. And this is because of how it works on smooth muscle um, uh, and reducing kind of colonic, well, basically peristalsis. And they will actually complain of muscle weakness. Now, if a calcium is, you might be asked, well, what calcium would you treat? And what would you do? If it's generally, my rule is anything above, um, uh, there's a question here from Huraya Mitazi. Addison's associated with hypocalcemia. There we go. That's my shout out. Um, but um, in terms of uh, with calcium, if it's, for instance, um, I would say 2.6 to 3, you can actually probably monitor that, okay, generally, providing they don't have massive symptoms. Now, one symptom you should be aware of is the risk of arrhythmia because hypercalcemia will cause a short QT. So you would want to do a question. So you want to see how affected they are being with this, okay? And you would tell them to drink more. Anything over three, three or above, you need to admit them. You need to give them intravenous fluids and you can give them bisphosphonates. So usually we give permidronate and things like that. Now, these will reduce the... Um, the calcium, but they do so and they take a while to do so. That's the important thing. You're not going to see a dramatic fall. You need to pump them up with fluids because they'll be dry, because they'll be polyuric. Um, and the reason that they're polyuric is increased calcium will block your loop of Henle from working. So you can't make a medullary concentration gradient, which means that you can't reabsorb water. That's basically how it works. Um, so you will be peeing a lot, so it'll be dry, pumping up the fluids and giving bisphosphonates. It will take about seven days for the bisphosphonates to kick in. Now, importantly, what we've talked about is when to think of primary hyperparathyroidism, to think about other conditions associated with. So we've talked about MEN1 and MEN2A. These are conditions where you will get primary hyperparathyroidism. And this is something to think about if somebody's coming in with a history of, you know, our doctor, um, yeah, I've had a previous pancreatic uh, cancer. Uh, I, I had an insulinoma. I also had a pituitary adenoma removed. And now they're coming in with signs of hyperparathyroidism. I'd be thinking, this person, there's a good chance this person has MEN1 syndrome. Um, and I'd be taking a family history. But there is a familial hyperparathyroidism as well. Now, how do we treat this? We usually give bisphosphonates. That is the mainstay of treatment medically. We operate only in very few circumstances, symptomatic. So they have to be markedly symptomatic. Most patients tolerate their calcium actually really well. Um, so that's something. Um, somebody's written, is ALP affected um, in primary hyperparathyroidism? So what you will find typically is that the alkaline phosphatase will be relatively static. It won't be markedly raised. Um, there are some other instances where it is, and we'll talk about that later, but it won't be massively different, though. No. Um, 
So if they're symptomatic, if they're osteoporotic, because obviously we want to stop that because this is going to just make it much, much worse. If they're having kidney stones, as soon as somebody has kidney stones, this is becoming a bit of an issue. Um, and you really need to do that because obviously the risks of the kidney stones is not only that you from kidney stones, but you get calcification of the kidney itself and that can cause renal failure and you can get all sorts. And if they're young, if they're less than 50, then we would really try to think of operating if they had some other risks. All right. Now, if we go on to the next slide, this will show you kind of basic bone biochemistry and what you should be looking for. Now, um, somebody's answered in, asked the question, is men common? Um, the answer is simply no. It's literally, um, I think it's like, it's not even one in a million. It's very, very rare. But the point is, is that if you miss it, um, and if you don't put the uh, things together, you'll have multi-generations affected with disorders. And especially if it's associated with FAO, you'll have a lot of young deaths potentially. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, in terms of bone biochemistry, these are the classical things that you would see. Now, the key things here are with kind of primary hypothyroidism, you get this classical increased calcium and low phosphate because of how it's working, and you get this overwhelming bone reabsorption. Hyper parathyroid hormone works to kind of block your osteoblasts, yeah? So it's going to make your osteoblasts not really work that much. That's why your alkaline phosphatase is so normal, okay? Because your osteoblasts are being paralyzed. They're being told, don't, don't do it. So um, that's where they're low. Renal osteodystrophy, this is what we're talking about with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this is what I mean. You'll get a normal or low calcium. Why? Because the kidneys are not functioning. The kidneys can't convert inactive to active vitamin D. So you can't absorb calcium in the first place. So you're running on fumes. And because the kidneys aren't working, you can't get rid of phosphate. So remember, they are the two triggers for why you get um, increased PTH. All right. And then metastasis, you would see all of them. Now we'll go on to Pagets simply later, so we'll go on to that. So can we go on to the next slide, please? This one, I think we should give 45 seconds. Just a sec. I'm just going to give a little bit more time to read because we had a few requests come in. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, these are my questions. I wrote them, and I'm sorry if they're horrible. Okay, let's pull it. 15 seconds? Yeah. Let's, let's give that a go. I might give it a little bit longer. We've only had 30 in. So. Oh, yeah, give them a bit longer. This is a, diff this is a hard one. Okay, last 10 seconds, guys. Yeah. And three. All right, let's see over there. I can't see the poll. So people have gone for pituitary apoplexy. Very, very well done. This is something that you may very well see in the setting of A&E. And I have seen this where it's not... Well, I wish you guys were in A&E, put it that way. Um, so let's just go for the question and deconstruct it. Somebody's come in with a sudden history of headache. Any person who comes in with a sudden history of headache, that's a bit of a concern. She's pregnant. I'm a bit more concerned. OK, especially if it's something that's going to affect consciousness because of her and the baby. She's aparexial. That's an important part of the history. Um, and we can say later on that she's well in herself. Now, that would, first of all, rule out meningitis. It would be very unusual. I mean, you can have sterile meningitis, but that would still cause you can you would still get symptoms beforehand before developing the characteristic signs. And the fact is aparexial means actually I'm feeling comfortable this probably isn't meningitis but you would be silly not to still do blood cultures in case all right now we also get the fact that she's hemodynamically compromised this lady is running quite quick 120 and her blood pressure is low you've done her blood tests oh you sorry you've done the collateral and she's been having some visual problems so straight away she's been having visual problems for some time there is something intracranial going on here yeah she's been having visual problems that predate this headache so this is either a cancer, 
there is some kind of growth basically that shouldn't be there now and when you examine her you notice that she has some palsies ocular palsies now this is a key and that she has no rash or neck stiffness so she doesn't have meningism great i can tick off meningitis subarachnoid hemorrhage you would need to consider this in any person who comes in with sudden history of headache reduced consciousness and hemodynamic instability you will still see in subarach the reason is you get increased sympathetic discharge which will cause some of these changes all right and because of the effects of having you know where the bleed is but here the major question is what is the most likely now giant cell arteritis is um not a very good diagnosis that is something exclusively in older patients over 50 esr over 50 and remember if you have gca you are likely that you have polymyalgia rheumatica this is not that it cannot be that idiopathic intracranial hypertension as well would not present like this with subarach you would need to do a scan so you would do a ct head for this late for this lady anyway to work out what's going on now a ct will diagnose about 95 to 98 percent of subarac the lp will find the two percent that is missed so if patients say i don't want the lp you can actually be quite reassured if that ct is done within 24 hours that being said for litigation purposes we do it now let's move on to the next slide and look about what pituitary apoplexy is now pituitary apoplexy is quite um honestly this is acute pituitary failure so this is i have got a tumor in my pituitary which we have now bled into this is very different to Sheehan syndrome, which you may have read about. Sheehan syndrome is where I've got hyperperfusion of my pituitary, and that is usually associated with pregnancy in the context of birth. So because of the acute blood loss, you get actual relative ischemia of um, the uh, pituitary gland and infarction. This is where there is an actual tumour, an adenoma present, which we have bled into. So as you can imagine, precipitating factors include anticoagulation, pregnancy, why because with pregnancy um not only you do get changes to your clotting but obviously you have a higher circulating volume and because of the general so uh, general blood pressure changes as well it's a major risk head trauma and dopamine therapy i won't go into why that is but th that is a thing now in terms of what this is the major features in this question that make me think about this is the sudden onset of it but also the visual changes she's had now, with a pituitary adenoma, the classical description of the loss of vision will be obviously a bitemporal hemianopia because we're affecting the optic chiasm and therefore the crossover of your um, of your nasal um, optic nerve fibers, which will obviously cross at the chiasm. Now, because if you if you ever want to find out where your pituitary is, it's just literally if you just put your you know your finger between your between your eyes it's literally there it's just at the sphenoid bone as you know so you literally get this retroorbital pain and because you get this bleeding into the the pituitary um what you get then is the pituitary stops working and one of the big things you lose is acth and the reason why this woman's sodium is low and the reason she's hypertensive is because she's acutely gone cold turkey from steroids she has no adrenal output of cortisol and remember, whilst you do have peaks and troughs of cortisol, um, the peak, by the way, in the morning is so that you mobilize your energy reserves so that you can physically restart the machine and get up, but also to increase your blood pressure because you're going to start standing up from bed and things. You always need steroids. So this acute thing, this acute deterioration with her is because she's actually stopped making any cortisol and she's ACTH deficient. Now, the visual loss um, the ocular palsy that we've mentioned is because of where this location is. So in the blue on this diagram is the cavernous sinus. Now the cavernous sinus, as you may recall, contains your cranial nerves 3, 4, 5A, 5B and 6. Okay, So it's containing all these cranial nerves. And the point is, is that if you get bleeding into this, you will quite quickly compress that, the, the cavernous sinus. Because remember, the cavernous sinus is a sinus. It's venous. It just has the internal carotid going through it. So it's very compressible. So you will get complex ophthalmoplegia. So she's got visual loss with complex ophthalmoplegia. So this is very, very important. And um, for the person who asked, that is, uh, runs through the cavernous sinus, you have the internal carotid artery, and you will have cranial nerves 3, 4, 5A, 5B, and 6. Okay. You will have others that will come up through all the things. So the ocular, yes, Kiana Bandak, 
the ocular palsy is because we're compressing the actual um, cavernous sinus. Remember what moves your eye, three, four, and six, all of which are in there. So that's why you're getting this ocular palsy. Now, with this patient, what you need to do is start them on steroids. So if you saw this patient, she's hypotensive. Give her fluids. That's great. That's going to help. What you want to do is give her some steroids, and you would want to do a full hormone panel. So pituitary hormone panel. So you want to check, is she, you know, the hypothyroid now? Is she got, as I said, the low ACTH? Has she got low FH and F FSH and LH and relative things and prolactin and things? Excuse me. What she'll need is steroids. So you'll need to give her um, hydrocortisone um, or even DEX. And the important thing I would say here, and this is something they don't teach you in med school, which is annoying. If she will have low thyroid hormone as well as low steroids. And if you're ever asked a question, which would you give first? You must always say, I will give the steroid first. Okay. The reason is if you give thyroid hormone, levothyroxine, for instance, as in IV, you will increase cortisol metabolism. So with this lady, if I started to replace her T4, I will actually worsen the cortisol uh, levels. I will make them even lower and she will get even sicker. So never do that. And how would we investigate this further? We want to give MRI and things like that. And actually most patients respond um, uh, kind of medically. The bleeding will settle and then they can have a removal of the adenoma. The reasons why you would do surgery you would do it in this patient because she's got visual problems and because, um, well, actually mostly because it's now causing visual changes and complex um, uh, neurology with the ocular palsy. I'll answer all questions, whether, let's just see if there's any major questions on this topic first. Um, somebody's asked, would cerebral trauma also lead to SIDH? Right, so SIDH, good. I mean, I like what you're thinking. I could also parry you with obviously cerebral salt wasting. It would not happen that quick. SADH does not happen in seconds. Yeah, if I've got a headache and now I've got low sodium. That's taking days. Okay, this is acute. She has lost steroid. SADH, you have to be very careful with how you diagnose that. And there's strict criteria. We can go through that, and I'm happy to be emailed questions about this, and I'll go through it. But this is not the thing that you'd be thinking of. Um, but the important thing for this question is that you're aware that pregnancy and pituitary apoplexy in somebody with with actual problems okay with actual pre-existing problems let's move on to the next question we're nearly there guys you're doing great Okay, so 20 seconds. All right. Hopefully this is nice. Yeah, five more seconds. Three, two. Okay, guys, let's see where we're at with this one. So we've said reduce dose of reach out. Oh, you, honestly, there are pharmacists somewhere who are screaming your name. This is great. You've got the right answer. So let's talk about this question a little bit and see why that is the case. She's 65. She's got hypothyroidism. The most common cause for this would be something like Hashimoto. So this is somebody like that. Now, when you're treating hypothyroidism in the elderly, remember, you start off low. So you would start off low dose, like 25 mics, and you go up slowly. If you go up too quickly, there are very high risk of going into atrial fibrillation and a high risk of causing, obviously, arrhythmias, other arrhythmias, which are much worse. Now, with her, she's on 75 mics. That's not huge, but her TFTs are very normal. They show that she is hyperthyroid. Yeah, we're over-treating her way too much. Now, the question is, what do you do? So, obviously, stopping levothyroxine, no. Increased levothyroxine will no. Add by sofralol. You could, if she was having major side effects from this, to try and help her, but that isn't going to fix anything. And rechecking in two weeks is not a good idea. The reason is when you give levothyroxine, so you ask why we can't stop levothyroxine. Well, stopping the levothyroxine, levothyroxine has about a week half life, okay? So it's going to be kicking around anyway. And also she's hyperthyroid. 
the risks obviously of you not treating her as well symptomatically she could become quite unwell with this going forward um, and the problem with hypothyroidism i don't know if you guys know even when you've stabilized the thyroid function test patients will describe clinical symptoms for a couple of months afterwards so i would not stop the levothyroxine this isn't dangerous it's just it really does need to be addressed and you wouldn't stop the thyroid she needs it so reducing the dose so as i said levothyroxine which is t4 has a half-life of about a week seven days but tsh has about a six-week half-life so that's why we wait for six weeks because that's how long it's going to take before the tsh has changed yeah so we'd reduce the dose so let's move on to the next slide and talk about levothyroxine thank you levothyroxine is absorbed in the small intestine it's not the stomach now this is important because you might have patients who have say now they have celiac disease or they've had inflammatory bowel disease they've had previous operations they may have sbs short bowel syndrome so you need to be aware of this when you're treating them all right now there are some variability with tsh levels anyway obese patients will have higher levels because of what leptin leptin is the hunger home is well leptin is the thing that makes you stop eating and like ghrelin which makes you want to eat um and leptin will will cause this now the key things when you're telling patients to take levothyroxine is that they should take it before breakfast on an empty stomach and they should take it before their other meds why because there's a lot of things that will affect the absorption of levothyroxine now, the classical one for you guys is iron. Please, if you have a patient who's on iron, you must tell them, and you see this classically, that they are not absorbing their uh, thyroid medication because they're taking iron at the same time. You tell them, take it, you should take your um, thyroid medication half an hour before breakfast, and you should wait at least two hours before taking iron. Other things include calcium, particularly if it's... Um, so usual, your calcium acetate used for those kind of things. PPIs will affect. Um, and another one of, is um, laxatives, which kind of makes sense. But certainly if they're aluminium containing laxatives, they, they actually bind to the uh, levothyroxine. Now, what we're aiming for with when we're trying to replace someone with hypothyroidism is obviously feel better, but we want to achieve a TSH within range. And realistically, you want the TSH um, just you know less than 2.5 just because you want to reduce the risks as we've talked about with ongoing risks of atrial fibrillation but also osteoporosis which are at increased risks of um, oh somebody's asked a good question how does it look when patients took their meds just before the review do you know what i like you because that is a good question and um, you need to be suspicious of this so what you would classically see in that instance is somebody who has a normal t4 because remember, if I've, um, say now they've taken it the day before, it's going to stick around. As we said, the half-life is a week, so it'll stay around. But the TSH will still be very high. So straight away, I don't even need them to sit indoors. I can tell them, actually, um, you haven't been taking a medication. Although, you know, you would, I would err on the side of caution to make sure they're not taking any other medications which are infecting the absorption but also malabsorption. Remember, if you've got hypothyroidism, very high incidence of celiacs. I remember celiacs, there's two peaks. Adulthood is one of them, particularly in the older, so over 50s. So that's something to think about. Anyway, that answers that question. Let's move on. Any other questions at the end, I will happily answer. Uh, let's do this one, yeah. So 20 seconds. Last five seconds. Got a few answers in. There we go. Coolio. So everyone thinks that this is Paget's disease. And I'm unfortunate this is not. And we will go on to, I'm going to tell you about Paget because I, I'm actually a big fan of it. So let's look at the question first. So 
this patient has difficulty from the seated position, diffuse joint and bone pain, okay? Um, and then we say that he's got a waddling gait, all right? Now, a waddling gait is a very characteristic gait. If you see, I, I, I implore you all to search waddling gait on YouTube. Uh, it is very indicative of a proximal myopathy. They've got issues there with a lot of weakness, and it basically looks like their legs are giving way every time they put a foot. Now, we can tell that the bone isn't great. They've had a fr recent fracture. He's only 60. And remember, we're much more concerned about osteoporosis and problems like that in patients who are postmenopausal and women. Now, out of these ones, we have to think hyperparathyroidism, there's no systemic signs of illness, and they wouldn't jump to that, and it wouldn't cause diffuse joint pain. Okay, it doesn't usually cause that. And um, this is a, a comp we're getting here a problem with muscles as well as the bone. Let's move on to the next slide and we'll talk through some of the options. So osteoporosis was one of the options. Now this is marble bone disease. So this is where you have, you don't need to be good at x-rays, but if you look at that one on the left versus the one on the right, the one on the left looks like somebody's put a light behind it. It is bright. And that's because you are making a lot of cortex. You are making a lot of bone. And this is where the osteoclasts no longer work. You no longer resolve bone. You're just constantly laying it down. Obviously, the problem with this is, is that the bone now becomes incredibly brittle and heavy. So it becomes heavy bone, very brittle, very likely to snap, and patients are usually very short. It will also invade the bone marrow because you haven't, you're making so much bone, there's no space for the bone marrow. So they're usually um, pancytopenic, so they have low um, anemic and all sorts. So it's not that. He would be stunted growth and he would have years of history. Paget's disease here, now, Paget's disease is something of elderly. Now, I can see why some of you have picked it, the pain, a fracture, but Paget's disease is rather pernicious. By that, I mean, uh, and rather insidious. It takes a little while to, to kind of pick up. Um, and how it usually presents Paget's is that it's isolated. You usually get isolated Paget's of a limb. So in this instance, you can see it's the hip. So if you look on the right hip, you might see that there's this white bit there, and it, it looks kind of fluffy. That's the way I would describe it. Um, and basically, Paget's disease is a disorder where you get, you get huge amounts of bone resorption, usually at one site. Might be the hip, might be the femur. And then what you get then is the osteoblasts think, well, I need to do my job now. And, but they do it in a really rubbish way. They lay the bone down in, instead of woven, instead of lamella bone, they just lay down woven bone they, in a very haphazard appearance which is why the bone looks fluffy it's of different thickness everywhere so this bone is functionally weak now this picture there on the right for the pagets is a famous lady called um the mistress from a 1500 dutch painting and she is thought to have pagets because what you get is this characteristic um ab deformed bone because as we said the bone is initially um broken down and then you just get huge amounts of bone deposition which causes this kind of site this kind of features and one of the characteristic one is this frontal bossing and you may see from her face her forehead looks insane it looks huge um, and that's why we think it now the risk factors with pagets and somebody's mentioned about alp previously um, what would you find in pagets you will have normal bone markers but your alp will be about 20 times higher than normal it will be huge off the scale why? Because the bone is going mental at that site. The osteoblasts are trying to lay down so many bone, uh, so much bone um, at, at the sites where there was previous breakdown. Now, um, other things that these patients are at risk of, just as a finishing note, is and something you need to be aware of, is increased risk of osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma, so bone cancer, is a massive risk in pagets, and we treat pagets simply with bisphosphonates or calcitonin. Osteoporosis, on the other hand, we actually treat with vitamin D because that stimulates your osteo, uh, osteoclasts to break down the bone. Don't ask me how, it's very complex and I don't actually know, you've got to be honest. So let's move on to the next slide and talk why this is the case. So osteomalacia is a problem with low vitamin D. Um, the um, Ellen Sanford, the increased risk is of osteosarcoma, so increased risk of bone cancer. They have an increased risk. There are two peaks, one in teenagers, 20 to 30, and one after 60, and that is because only because of pagets. Now, osteomalacia is low vitamin D, phosphate, and calcium. So basically, the bone is rubbish. The bone 
you are forming what we know is osteoid. So osteoid, as you know, is the first bit of bone that is laid down by osteoblast. And then using ALP, um, you will form then, um, you will actually add calcium hydroxyapatite, which makes your cortex the strong bone that we like. Because you can't do that, because you've got lack of vitamin D and calcium, therefore you form this bone that is just bendy, all right? Um, and it literally bends like nothing else. And that's why you increase risk of fractures. Now, because of this bending bone, the vitamin D also has quite an integral part with also muscle maintenance. And patients will often describe this diffuse joint of bone pain. Doctor, I find it difficult in the morning. I stand up and my, my, muscle, my muscles feel like, and my joints feel like cements in them. Um, and they will often, when you examine them, they may have this... Um, what we call um, genuvarum. So this is where you have bending of the knees away from the midline, which is what we can see in the picture of the hip. Um, and so they have this very increased kind of distance between the knees. And that is why we get this kind of waddling gait. The bone is just very, very poor. Now, when you do your investigations for these patients and you do a bone profile, you know, to investigate this, you would do a vitamin D level, which will confirm it's low. And you would say this is, uh, this is the case. But because of vitamin D and how it works with absorbing calcium and phosphate from the gut, they would have decreased levels of this. I remember, why is the ALP raised? Because the osteoblasts are desperate to lay um, cortical bone. They're desperate to now add calcium hydroxyapatite to this bone, but they can't because they haven't got enough resources. Uh, and because we've got decreased calcium and phosphate, we get a compensatory PTH rise. But the PTH rise will be nothing like you'll see within primary hyperparathyroidism. It will not be very, very raised. It will just be higher, slightly higher than normal. So this is, with endocrinology and with a lot of these hormones, you will commonly find hormones that are just above the reference range. If they're only just above, that's not the cause of it. If my PTH should be one and it's 1.02, I haven't got primary hyperparathyroidism. If it's four, yeah, I probably do, all right? There's a very complex interplay. Um, born, um, knowing about born is quite important. So let's move on to the um, last question. I'm sure I heard a lot of sighs of relief there. Um, and we'll give that about 30 seconds or something. I'm really sorry, guys, if it's taking so long. I do feel bad. Should we give it 10 seconds then? Yeah, we're getting, uh, say, five more seconds then. That's, that's... Let's, let's see where we're at. Cool. Okay, guys, so we've seen quite a range, but the majority have gone for double and steroid dose. That is correct. This is a good question, not to be a modest, but it's just because you're going to see this a lot, okay? You've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and she's on maintenance PRED. Now, you do sometimes see patients who are still on maintenance PRED. This tells you they have horrific rheumatoid because obviously we have DMARDs now, which have replaced it. But she's had it and she's been on it for long term and 10 milligrams is above physiological dose. Okay, so I can tell you that straight away. Five milligrams is physiological. So she's above, she's needing, yeah, she's got more steroid in her than a normal person would. And she hasn't taken it for three days. Now, the big question you need to be met and the big thing you need to be thinking of if we move to the second slide, um, if the uh, next slide, sorry, is about secondary adrenal insufficiency. Because she's taking steroid, the prednisolone, the prednisolone is going to have a negative effect on a HPA axis, okay? It's going to have switched it off. The hypothalamus is no longer really doing anything. It's gone lazy, so it's not releasing uh, you know, corticotropin releasing hormone. Therefore, the pituitary isn't releasing ACTH. And as a result of this, the adrenals are just not doing anything because someone else is doing their job. Why do they need to do it? So with this lady, she's at very high risk of going into adrenal crisis. She has going to have a lack of um, cortisol and a lack of actual uh, aldosterone in the system. Okay, so she's an adrenal insufficiency. 
Now, usually, if I said to you classical symptoms of Addison's, I'm sure all of you can list a billion. But the point is, she will come in with postural hypertension, she will come in fatigued, weakness, you get abdominal pain, and she may, on her blood tests, if you did them, she may very well have a low sodium increased potassium. Now, although that I should add, it's usually you find an isolated sodium only, just low sodium. But the point is, cortisol and steroids in the body increase in stress states. Cortisol is a stress hormone, okay? Which is why if you have a hypoglycemic attack, for instance, one of the key hormones that's released, apart from adrenaline, which is what gives you the shakes, is cortisol, okay? Cortisol is the stress hormone. So any stress, and by that, I don't mean emotional, um, although emotional stress does actually raise it, but I mean more physiological, so surgery and acute illness, then actually this will mean that your steroid requirements will increase, okay? Because what happens during illness is you try to mobilize your energy resources to improve the immune response and also to control the immune response. You don't want to go into you know, septic shock or whatever. So you need increased um, steroid hormone. Now, because she's missed three days, this patient is somebody who you need to urgently get um, you need to urgently get some steroid into. So what would you do? I wouldn't give her prednisolone orally. I would give her IV hydrocortisone, okay? And most of these patients who are long-term steroids will have um, a, what we call a kind of uh, emergency pack. So they'll have a temperature, a uh, thermometer, so they can measure the temperature, and you tell them, if your temperature is over 37.5, yeah, on two consecutive, double your steroid dose, yeah? If they're vomiting so much, they can't do it, or in this case, um, you know, uh, well, actually, if they were at home and they said, I'm vomiting, I've taken the meds, I've vomited two seconds after, you would tell them straight away, you take the IV hydrocortisone. If they come into hospital and they've had three days off, you need to give them a stat one now. And that will ensure that you are covering them for this acute stress response and that you're ensuring that they won't go into adesonium crisis. Okay, that's that. Um, now, I've actually finished with them. Uh, I've got some questions. So let's see where we go. How many slides left? Well, for the anonymous, oh, I, I forgot about this last slide. Let me just tell you about this. This is important. Steroid withdrawal. So she's on long-term steroids. You may be asked, um, doctor, um, do we need to wean this patient off steroids? The key question is how much and how long? My general rule and the general rule of most kind of groups, if you're over 40 milligrams, okay, over 40 milligrams steroid daily, or if you're having more than then you need to be weaned off. Likewise, if you're a patient, say now COPD patients, oh, we throw steroids at them left, right, and center. They may have had four exacerbations in the year. If they have had that, you cannot just stop their steroid. You must bring it down because their adrenals are becoming lazy. They haven't shut off, but they're not going to be working very well. They've got used to someone else doing the job for them. So what you would do is come up with reducing regime. Now, usually the way I like to do with my reducing regimes is that I go five milligrams down every three days. So say now, this is my second COPD exacerbation doctor uh, this year. I've come in and I, um, we're stopping the steroids now. I'm treating. I would say, fine, let's reduce five milligrams every three days. When we get to five milligrams, then stop. That way, then we reduce the risks of them going into, um, as I said, adrenal insufficiency because this, because as I'm reducing this down, the, the adrenals are now picking up the pace and starting to do the job for me. Um, and that's what I would generally say. Now, somebody's asked the question, would you need to increase steroid doses prior to surgery? Very good. You need to be, what you would normally do for this patient, actually, is that you would give them IV hydrocortisone in, before induction. Okay? So you would give it to them exactly. So that's perfect. Ooh, now, I love this question that's come through. What are your thoughts on the use of dexamethasone to treat patients with COVID? Now, I've written a COVID paper and I've talked about dexamethasone. The evidence for dexamethasone is dubious, I would say, um, it, because it didn't make much of a difference with SARS um, and MERS, which are also coronaviruses. The, the thing I would say with dexamethasone is if you've, got cons if you've already got ARDS, then dexamethasone will certainly help reduce the inflammation and reduce the risk of fibrosis going forward and can help with the resolution. But if you haven't reached the stage where you've got acute respiratory distress syndrome, then actually they're probably not that useful. Now, in terms of things that we've covered today, we've covered a lot. I hope to Lord I haven't bored you all and that it's been um, hopefully um, kind of eventful and not just because I kept disconnecting. Uh, and I hope you've learned something.
I'm happy to be contacted at any time. My email's on the next um, uh, slide. And I'm happy to take questions now if people are typing them in um, and to, um, to, to, to fill in. I, I don't know if there are any open questions. Uh, I've answered a few, but is there anybody with any burning questions? Amazing uh, lecture, Dom. Thank you so much. Really, really good. I was trying to to do other stuff, but I kept coming in to your to your voice back. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting, actually. <laughs> well, that's well, I'm glad. That, Yezen, you're just too kind. Honestly, okay. can I just say, everybody, Yezen's the nicest human being you'll meet. So you couldn't <laughs> ask for a better person to run this. So. Thank you, um, but I don't think. Uh, is there any other question? I can't read if there's any questions for me. Oh, um, Yezin is the best. Yeah. Whoever that was, I agree. What attracted you to endocrinology? Um, actually, it's not something I want to do going forward, funnily enough. Um, I want to do either infectious disease or heme. Um, could you repeat the last bit about steroid withdrawal? Right, let's just go over this quickly. So steroids, as I said before, the main risk if you've been on long-term steroids and I remove them is the fact that when I say remove them, remove them abruptly. So say now this patient has been on 10 milligrams for long term for rheumatoid. If I stop them the day after and just said, yeah, you're fine now, she will go Edisonian on you. OK, she will go into adrenal crisis. And the point is, because that HBA axis is switched off, what you need to do is um, withdraw it gradually so that the adrenals are now picking up the work so that the HBA axis starts to resume. And so you come up with a regime to reduce. Now, it's very much dependent on the clinical situation. I can't give you for everything, but generally a sensible one is five milligrams every three days or five milligrams a week if they're particularly symptomatic or if there have been concerns previously because of steroid withdrawal. Um, and, you know, usually you'll see this with your COPD patients, for instance, who they would have had multiple instances of this. Um, any other burning questions? Um, I don't, is this going to be on the YouTube channel? Yeah. It is. So it will. It will be on the QuestMed Tutorials YouTube channel though. Um, but we will post the link on both, the link to the video on both the QuestMed Tutorials Facebook page and also the Study Hub one um, for just to save any confusion. So somebody's just asked one, uh, one question as well. I'll only, I'll take just like two more if that's okay, guys. Um, but the concept of ALP. So ALP is a marker of bone turnover. All right. Now, one thing I would add as well, just for your general learning, is that ALP is also an acute phase reactant. So it's similar to a CRP, okay? So ALP will rise in inflammatory reactions. Now that's by the by. Now in terms of with hyperprimary hyperparathyroidism, what you're doing is the PTH works on osteoclasts to increase bone resorption, all right? It increases the expression of rank and rank ligand. But what it does to your osteoblasts, it basically paralyzes them. So what you will find is, yes, you normally find that actually patients will have a normal or slightly increased ALP because the parathyroid hormone is stopping them from working. You're getting unopposed osteoclast activation. So that's why you don't generally get, uh, you won't get, for instance, the same level of increase of ALP as you do in, for instance, Paget's disease. But um, it's a good question. All right. Anything else now before I... Oh, thank you, NK. That's very, very kind. Um, I, I don't think there's anything else. Uh, oh, will you come back for more lectures if you're interested? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, to be honest, I would be more than happy if anybody wanted 